cut you you've you've certainly come a long way since well maybe we both have come a long way since then now let, let's talk about your role as uh, head of the social mobility commission first but i do want to talk a lot about schools and education because i know that's that's your main passion um social mobility is one of those awful phrases that we we all hear it and we kind of know what it means but what does it mean to you well to me it means people being able to fulfill their talents and find purpose in their lives and happiness um I think too often we imagine social mobility is about someone growing up in the slums and then becoming some top CEO, top mm. banker and super rich. Um, not all of us want to be billionaires, uh, but we all do want to feel like we've contributed and found purpose in our lives. So I think that's it. And sometimes because people don't have the right start in life, um, perhaps they don't get the best education, they don't find the right routes into the work that they'd like to do, they then end up not feeling fulfilled. And that, that's a shame. Do you think that social mobility has gone backwards in recent years? Uh, no, it depends. I mean, the evidence, it, it shows a mixed picture. It depends on what you're looking at. Um, and some evidence will say that it's improved and some evidence will say that it has declined. So it depends. Are you looking at income mobility? Are you looking at occupational mobility? But um, what's key is not so much where we are now. It's where, how do we make it better? Because it can always be better, can't it? And uh, the commission, we're, at the commission, we're looking at three things, really. We're looking at families. We're looking at education, schools, and then routes into the workplace. What are the main barriers to social mobility at the moment? Um, well, that, I, you know, it's interesting the way you put it, you know, to say what the barriers are. Um, well, for example, if we were having this conversation 30 years ago, I would say that class was one of the main barriers to social mobility, that the, that the circumstances that you, you were born into would have a massive effect on how you progressed in, in your life. Now, that's still the case in, in some ways, but you, you'd hope over the last 30 years that that barrier had, had at least been diminished. Yeah, I, I wouldn't Yeah, I wouldn't put it that way because um, it depends on, for instance, schools might be a barrier. Um, and it might be a barrier more so for uh, working class children because they might not be in areas where they'll be able to access a good or outstanding school. Um but it's not so much class that's preventing them from being socially mobile. It's whether or not they're accessing the right skills and knowledge that will enable them to reach for whatever it is mm. they want in life. Um, similarly with families. Families have a huge impact on, on someone. If you have, um, and sometimes there, there are poor families, uh, working class families, where the children do very well. And why is that? Because the family might be making the right choices in terms of being interested in education, um, uh, working hard at home, um, spending their time on the things that will enable that young person to become socially mobile. Um, there are barriers. I mean, at the moment, the Commission is looking at uh, uh, various different qualifications and what they mean in the workplace. Uh, what is their labor market value? You know, sometimes families, uh, young people who don't know uh, what the what the value of the qualification is, they end up doing the wrong qualification or they do a qualification they think will help them. And they spend years doing that. And in the end, it doesn't make that much difference to their life. So that can be a barrier. But um, but then there's lots that we're getting right, too. You know, there's some excellent schools out there doing a great job and changing the lives of young people. Uh, I suppose we just want those to multiply. I was recording a podcast this afternoon with Sebastian Payne from the FT, who's about to move to head, head up a think tank. And he comes from Gateshead. And he was telling me that um, his high school was a, a pretty rough one. And his mother, and she was a single mother at the time, she scrimped and saved to have enough money to send him to a private sixth form. And he said that was the key moment in his life. That gave him the opportunity that he wouldn't have had right. if he'd stayed at that school. Um, now he And he knows he's quite lucky to have had that. Yes. There are so many kids that can't possibly get that. The, the, yes. So therefore, they aren't fulfilling their potential. The country isn't getting what it could out of them because yes. they, 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 they aren't fulfilling their potential. Isn't that one of the main tasks of your commission to make sure that everybody has that opportunity. 
Yes, so you've just mentioned the importance of schools, and I agree with you. Schools are everything. Um, well, I say everything. Families and schools. Those are the two big levers that we can try and pull to help more children become socially mobile. Um, the state can try and support families and give advice to families, but of course with schools, that's all about the state. And I suppose the big question is how can the state uh, uh, help more schools be better, essentially? But when you even mention the word family, that seems to trigger people nowadays. Yes, that's and, right. And I mean, when I when I put on Twitter that you were coming on this program today, I mean, you, you seem to have become quite a hate figure for some people. <laughs> You're quite controversial, and I've never understood this. In that, to me, most of what I hear you say is just eminent common sense. That yes. if, if you have a stable family background, yes, uh, with, with with parents that instill values in you, you are more likely to succeed in life than, yes. than if you don't. Well, I don't understand why that's controversial. Well, I think people feel that you're then blaming the family and what they'd rather you do is blame the government. Um, and people like to blame the government because just face it. Oh, it's a national pastime. But you know, there's a they... lot of reasons to do that nowadays. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> yes, perhaps. Although I would say that families have um, agency. People have agency. And for us to deny the fact that we have agency removes part of what it is to be human. Um, mm. And it, it also just removes, you know, it's just insulting and patronizing to say that certain people don't have agency and what they need is to be looked after all the time by the state. Um, we, we all need guidance and encouragement, of course, and the state can do more. But it is also the case, as you've just said, that in some families, your example there, uh, you know, where you get to a different school, a mum makes a real effort, um, a mum scrimps and saves and does extraordinary things for her child. Uh, that does happen. And it's something that we can all learn from. And for us to pretend that everyone's in the same boat, um, it, it, well, it's just... I don't think it's real, but people don't like don't like that, you know. Does it come back to sort of some sort of class warfare at the moment? You've got Labour saying that they want to charge VAT on school fees. Well, um, Seb Payne's mother would have had to pay an extra twenty percent, and maybe that would have been the straw that broke the camel's back, and then maybe Seb wouldn't have gone to that school yes. and wouldn't have had a really successful career that he's had so far. Yeah, you know, I I am on the fence about that policy with Labour. I don't really mind about private schools. I don't resent them. I don't mind them being there. I do think it's a bit of a red herring because only 7% of children go there. 93%, most of the country, are in state schools. So insisting on attacking the private schools, I don't think that's going to make state schools better. And that's my main focus is how do we mm. make state schools better? You can go after the private schools, fine. I suppose they'll say, well, it give us more money. But then I think we go down the road of saying... The only thing that matters is money. And of course, look, I'm a headmistress. I would love more money. Everybody wants more money. But I don't think that's the main thing that's going to make schools better. Uh, there is power in money. There is even more power in good ideas. And the power of bad ideas is huge. And I do think if we were to spend more of our time looking at what works and less time being distracted by conversations around private schools and all that stuff, it would just be much better for us to be concentrating on what works uh, in schools and m making that work all over the place. Tell us about your school. Well, as you said, the people consider me to be the strictest headmistress in Britain. Um, and why do they say that? Because I suppose we're pretty strict. You know, if the children uh, were to turn around in a lesson, they'd get a demerit. Second time, they get a detention. Um, if they don't bring in their homework, they get a detention. Uh, people seem to think that, um, well, some people, you know, some, you know, our families obviously love it, but there are some people out there who think that we make children miserable. Um, you know, we had some guests in today. Uh, the children were guiding them around the school and they said, well, we've come to see whether or not you're a concentration camp because that's what oh we've heard. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so they actually said that. Yeah. And the kids said to me, we we're a bit confused when they said that. <laughs> we don't understand. And of course, they don't understand because today at lunch, uh, Santa arrived with lots of various presents for the kids. I mean, Santa was their head of year dressed up, obviously, and there were lots of injuries 
jokes and lots of fun. And um, we should say that you're sitting opposite me <laughs> in a Christmas dress. <laughs> yes, well, it's a Christmas suit, I'd say actually, <laughs> and I had that on all day. Not obviously, part at school. of the uniform, if I may say so. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, by the way, you can watch us if you want to. Uh, we're streaming on Global Play, so you, <laughs> you can see Catherine's uh, outfit as well. Very Christmassy. Uh, yeah, no, indeed. And the kids are so happy and have so much fun at school, and they love it. Um, but weirdly, there are people who, on their behalf, campaign against us, trying to save them from the evils of the strictest headmistress in Britain, which is just really quite silly because our kids are very happy, parents are very happy, and they're doing very well. We did get the top progress eight in the country this year. So uh, they really like working hard and making themselves socially mobile. That's the thing. They are in a position when they leave us where they've maximized their potential, they're fulfilling their talents, and they are going to go off in life to find purpose and happiness. I don't know why anybody would be against that, really. Well, why are they? Because it, that that approach to education nowadays doesn't seem to fit the progressive narrative. Well, that's why. So th they especially don't like it if uh, when people... Uh, kind of counter that progressive narrative because, um, well, if you're an ideologue and you believe that this is the way, and even when the evidence shows you that that's wrong, you're going to keep pursuing that way because you're an ideologue, essentially. Um, I don't know. They just don't believe that this sort of thing works. We have an open door policy. People come and visit us all the time. We get a thousand guests a year, um, mainly teachers. And it has to be said, look, the people, you'll say, people uh, don't like me, you know, who are responding to you on Twitter. I think that they're a very loud minority. Uh, I think lots of people, I know all our guests, are very grateful for the opportunity to come and look. But they're always slightly incredulous. You know, they look mm. and they say, well, do you, do you have your own admissions policy? Do you select kids? And we don't. We just have, we don't select our kids. The council does. They give us kids just like they give kids to all the other schools. Um, and in fact, even if we did select kids, Compare us to any of the private schools that select. I can tell you our kids are better behaved. I can tell you that our kids are learning an enormous amount. Um, I set the challenge to anyone, really. Go, live, go visit the private schools that do select and then compare us to them and you will find because the private school teachers that come say, wow, you've really given us food for thought. I can't believe the way your kids are putting our kids to shame. And I don't know what the school was like before you, you um, went there. Is it one of these schools that, that has been completely turned round? No. Oops. So we started from scratch in 2014. Right. And we were able to build the school in a particular vision. And so all the teachers who were so there... So this is a free school, basically. It's a free school, yeah. exactly. That's so right. that's Actually, another reason... I did know that. <laughs> right, yes. Well, uh, you know, uh, that's another reason why people didn't like us. I mean, people campaigned against us to try and stop us from opening. It took us three and a half years. People would protest outside. People would send all kinds of threats of violence, even death threats. It was... it's it's. It's, it's been mad. Um, and when I say we had to hire bouncers, you know, uh, for, for parent evenings when we were trying to advertise our school, when we were handing out flyers to say, hey, here's a new option for parents. I kept saying, gosh, you'd think that we were setting up, you know, some kind of nuclear arms factory when actually all we're doing is setting up a school. But since then, of course, we moved from strength to strength. And as I say, we got the top progress eight. We're doing very well. Our kids academically are performing high, you know, very highly. And... Um, and, well, we're doing what I think everybody should want, which is helping children from ordinary backgrounds, disadvantaged children, um, reach for the stars. I mean, isn't that what we all want? And presumably it's quite a, a, a mixed community as well. If you, yeah. You're in Wembley. Yes. So you, you've got sort of integration challenges as, as well as the challenges that any other school would have. Yes. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's the inner city. Um, so we've got standard inner city intake, uh, lots of ethnic minorities, um, a whole variety of different religions and races and so on. Um, and of course, you know, it's the values of the school that people don't like. I always say I have small C conservative values and people don't like that because, you know, the C word is, 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 is it makes people cringe. Um, but my position is that lots of big C conservatives are not small C conservatives. Um, and you'll find people on the left. My own father, for instance, is a man on the left, but he's very much a small C conservative. Um, and what are those values? The values that are about personal responsibility and believing in that, um, having a sense of duty towards your community and service towards your country. Um, uh, 
holding yourself to account, other people to account and holding your standards very high, working hard, you know, um, the, being grateful for what you've got, even though it might not be that much. Uh, but knowing that you have more, you'll always have more than somebody else, you mm. know, uh, people can shy away from those values these days, which is a shame because I think they make us stronger. Uh, all of us, and it makes the country stronger. So when we have all these different cultures and races and so on, we sing God Save the King and I've added my country in Jerusalem. We very much belong to our country. Uh, we teach the children British history and British geography, and we're proud to be British, you know. So I am... Um, you really will be drawn down to the brownies for saying that. Well, this is it. So you <laughs> see, there's lots of things that we do that make me unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to talk more to Catherine Belsing in just a minute and we'll be taking your calls. So let's stack them up. 0345 973 You're listening to LBC. It's 19 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Ian Dale, text 84850. This is LBC. 21 minutes past eight, 0345 6060973, if you'd like to ask Catherine a question. I'm going to read out two paragraphs from your Wikipedia entry, which you might think is a rather dangerous thing to do, but um, I just think it's really interesting. It says, uh, Burble Singh was born in, shall I mention the year, 1973, in <laughs> a Auckland, New Zealand, the elder of two daughters of Frank Burble Singh, an academic of indo guyanese origin, and his wife Norma, a nurse from Jamaica. Burble Singh grew up mostly in Toronto and was educated at Victoria Park College Institute with brief periods in Nigeria and France. She graduated from the University of Oxford after reading French and philosophy at New College. At university, she was a member of the Socialist Workers' Party and read Living, <laughs> Living Marxism. Now, they know I, a lot about me. It's oh, amazing. <laughs> I think, but it's fascinating that that sort of very cosmopolitan international mm. upbringing, mm. Um, how much does that influence your, your thoughts now? Yeah, hugely. I mean, one of the reasons why I don't think Brit Britain is a racist country, and that's one of the things I say that gets me into trouble um, is because I've lived in other places and I've seen lots. And so, you know, the thing that we always need to ask is when you're saying the society is X, well, in comparison to what? If we think Britain is so racist, in comparison to which country are you talking about? You know, um, I think that Britain's a really great place to live. That doesn't mean that there aren't, there isn't racism. It doesn't mean there aren't racist people in it. But I do think that it's, it's, a, it's just so free and wonderful and supportive. And I love it, really. Um, so I do think my international upbringing and experiences uh, just helps to inform my views and um, makes me feel really lucky. You know, I spent a summer working in South Africa, you know, in the early oh, 2003, I suppose it was, and um, working in schools there. And gosh, life was tough. You know, um, I, I just think some of us in the West can often forget how lucky we are to live where we do. 
Have you ever been almost frightened off what you do by the criticism that you've had, not just on social media, but I mean, you, you, I think you first came to real prominence with a lot of people when, when you spoke at a Conservative Party conference on, on yeah. education. And there was this immediate visceral reaction from the left saying, well, how, how dare she do that? Yeah. I mean, there must have been, there must be times when, when it gets you down. Well, then it was quite shocking because I was just an ordinary deputy head in a school. So, mm. And I was essentially cancelled. I mean, cancelling wasn't, it was 2010, so it was before we called it that. But I was told I would never work in the state sector again. The reason why I had to set up my own school was because it was the only way I could get back into uh, teaching in, in di- disadvantaged areas, which is what I loved. I didn't want to go and work in a private school. So... Uh, then it was really shocking because I wasn't used to this sort of thing. Now I am used to it, of course. Um, And I sort of feel it's my duty to uh, tell people what's going on um, in schools, the the, the bureaucracy, some of the poor behaviour, what teachers have to endure, uh, because not everybody can say this stuff out loud because they're worried about losing their jobs. Um, Because being cancelled really, I think, is a a real threat to people these days. Mm. So... Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I then, gosh, three and a half years of me scrambling around trying to find a b- bit of journalist work, a bit of, you know, I mean, I, I lost, I, I wasn't, I didn't have a salary and I was, um, and I was trying to set up the school and it, by now we look at it and we say, oh, look, she set up the school. It's great. But at the time I didn't know we were going to succeed. In fact, there are lots of free schools that tried to open that never succeeded because their detractors won and mm. stopped them from, from opening. Luckily in my case, uh, we just kept going and I was a dog with a bone and eventually we did open. But as I say, we had to hire bouncers. There were people protesting. When we finally did open, there were still people protesting outside, handing out leaflets to the kids saying how their lives were in danger because uh, of, of of building issues and that, you know, and parents would be ringing and saying what's going on. You know, it... it um. it has been a real fight, but uh, I'm so pleased we did fight because we've now got... An example of what is possible, you know, and lots of teachers come and they look at it and they say, wow, I'm going to take this idea and that idea back to my school. And then I hear from them and they say, look, it's changed my school. Uh, and, you know, much much of what we do, frankly, we've taken those ideas from other schools. Is, is there enough of that? Is, is there some, I mean, I, I, who was I talking to an education minister recently? And I said, is there some sort of national hub that all schools can dial into and learn best practice, something that's worked in one school that could be deployed in another. And I, I don't think there is. But, you, I mean, you're, you're again making the case for such a thing because we can all learn from each other. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I don't know if you need the hub. People do know where there are good schools and people know, you know, they just need to look at the schools that are high achieving and then they can go and visit them. Um, certainly, I mean, as I say, we have up to a thousand visitors a year. The question isn't so much, the problem isn't that there's no hub. It's whether or not people want to make those changes. If they want to question ideas that they've held for a very long time. That, that, that's the big issue. That comes from the top, doesn't it? I mean, this is where I, I always think if a school is a good school... It's got a good head teacher. Find me a school that is a good school yes. that has a weak head teacher, <coughs> that has no leadership skills. It's al- almost impossible to find, I would have yes. thought. Yes. No, 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 you're right. You're right. It, 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 the head, a big part of it is the head. But obviously, the more teachers who are engaged with the idea of improving and getting better and finding out what works and going with that, the easier it is on the head <laughs> to mm. make that happen. So um, where it's easy on me is that I, we started from scratch. So I filled the building with lots of really dedicated teachers who are, you know, thrilled about the idea of making a change here, making a change there and improving all the time. Uh, not all head teachers are as lucky as I am, so they don't necessarily have that. And also, if you're in a more remote area, much more difficult to have your choice about mm. which teacher you're going to choose to hire. You know, so it can be quite difficult for them. Um, and I do feel for them. Uh, so really what would be ideal is to move the whole country in terms of what we think works and what we don't what what doesn't work you know and to look at the cognitive science on how children learn to weigh up the evidence to look at the schools that do well and compare them and think well what is it that they have in common that of course we're looking at in the social mobility commission i mean you, you know and then when we look at the evidence believe the evidence you know um 
uh, you know, people might come to our school and there are other schools. It's, we're not, it's not just us. There are other schools that you can go and see and then think, well, maybe we'll try this different thing. Maybe lineups in the yard work rather than letting all the kids in at once and then they kind of stomp in and kind of run around the corridors and scream and shout. Maybe it'd be an idea to have them all up in lines, uh, you know, according to the class that they're going into next. And maybe it'd be an idea to have them walking in silence to that class because then there are no issues because they get there quickly and quietly and they're learning immediately. But then people will say, how dare you, silent corridors, you're oppressing children. And I say, but it's a minute and a half and it means they get to their lesson really quickly and then they're learning. And of course, when you are trying to catch up a child who's 11 years old and has a chronological reading age of a, of a seven-year-old, well, you want as much time as possible in the lesson. So why wouldn't you want to make the corridor silent in order to do that? But there are some people who are adamant that's wrong. You know, you mustn't do that to children. But I'm adamant that it's wrong not to teach them how to read and not to expose them to the best possible teaching all of the time so that they have a chance of leaving school numerate and, and literate. And unfortunately, there are lots of children who leave school functionally enumerate and functionally illiterate. Um, and that's because those small little things like lineups and, and um, silent corridors and uh, a, behave, a centralized behavior system um, and loving the children so that they know you're on their side, so that they buy into the system. Uh, you know, it, it, if those things don't happen, then the teachers can't teach, they can't hear themselves think, um, and I don't think people realize just how much disruption there can be in classrooms across the country. Mm. We will come to your calls in a moment with Catherine Burble Singh, 0345 6060 So many things that we've talked about in the last half an hour that you must have a view on that you might like to ask Catherine about, whether you're a parent, teacher, just an ordinary member of the public concerned about the state of our education system. And indeed, please do ask her about her role as chair of the Social Mobility Commission. You're listening to LBC. It's 8.30. Let's get the news headlines with Daryl Jackson. Three boys of the same family have been named as four children who died after falling through the ice on a lake in the West Midlands. It happened near Solihull on Sunday. Their schools have been paying tribute, as has the local community who've been leaving flowers, cards and soft toys. The health secretary has been defending the government's position not to negotiate pay with nurses, claiming he doesn't want to take money away from patients. Members of the Royal College of Nursing are on strike. Steve Barclay insists he values them hugely. And the search for people who fell into icy water in the English Channel has been called off. Four people died when their dinghy capsized yesterday morning and 39 were rescued. LBC weather, fewer wintry showers across the far north tonight. Outbreaks of rain for western Scotland with snow developing in the west later and lows of minus eight. This is LBC.
Ian Dale on LBC. 8.34 on LBC. Catherine Burblesing, the chair of the Social Mobility Commission, is with me. She's also a head teacher, as you've been hearing, of the Michaela Community School in Wembley. Toby is in Wokingham. Hello, Toby. Hi, Ian. Hi, Catherine. Hi there. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I just wanted to start by saying that your point around individual agency is really, really valid. It's fundamentally dehumanising to deny that people have individual agency. Sometimes people make good choices. Sometimes people make bad choices. And that doesn't matter what creed or colour or anything like that they come from. And we should be free to talk about those and to, to call those out. So I think your point is absolutely, um, your point is absolutely spot on there. Um, Something that I really wanted to get your view on is we hear a lot these days about um, mental health activism in schools. Uh, and my partner's a teacher uh, in, in, the, in the primary school system. And it, uh, it seems very much that a lot of the um, uh, mental health education these days seems to be around feelings and how actually your feelings are these things that are in control of you. You're, they are completely in control of you. They trump a lot of other things. And it, it seems to be the first question that we ask children a lot these days. How did that make you feel? Anything that happens, how did that make you feel? But I'm 27 and just I was always taught by my parents and uh, and what I remember from school as well, that actually you're in control of your feelings and it's healthy to have an awareness of them. But actually your feelings are something that you control. And then further to that as well, is this focus on feelings and um, uh, is this over focus on feelings and the fact that uh, children are not being taught that they're able to control them? Uh, is that then breeding a, uh, a more sensitive generation? I have my own observations from the uh, f- from the workplace as well, but I would be interested in your view. Yes, I think that's right. Um, if it's if you're not in control of your feelings, then um, you're you're not in control of your actions um, because you, you you feel a certain way and then you just lash out. Um, and that refers to my point about uh, embracing personal responsibility. Uh, small C conservative values wouldn't allow you just to indulge in your feelings. Um, now that doesn't ma- mean that there aren't mental health issues. Of course there are. But and in fact, I would argue that. Um, owning your feelings, being in charge, feeling responsible for yourself is the way in which you can keep yourself mentally healthy. Um, So uh, I I think what you're describing is unfortunately sometimes um, people in schools can uh, take the the wrong approach, I think, to uh, supporting young people when they're feeling upset about things or struggling in any kind of way. and and I do think that this is an issue of our de- of our time now with social media that the children access and the unsupervised access to the internet really can harm their mental health. But I don't think it's helpful just to talk about feelings. It's much more helpful to to do what you're suggesting, which is to which is that you're in control of them. Toby, it's really helpful. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, text here from Vidal, who says, please ask Catherine how her views that lower social socioeconomic groups should not be encouraged to Oxbridge are compatible with her role improving social mobility. Pupil expectation is one of the biggest drivers of ambition and ultimately success. Yes, well, and of course, that's what we do at our school. Unfortunately, the caller or the texter is um, has read newspapers that like to misquote me. Um, what I said was not that uh, children shouldn't aim for the best, you know, for whatever it is that they want to do. But like I started when you asked me, what is social mobility? I said it's about finding purpose and happiness and fulfilling your talents. Uh, it isn't necessarily... Uh, making everybody into a top banker who's going to earn lots of money and that we shouldn't only celebrate those children. We have a tendency to only think that, that to feel that social mobility is only existing when a child gets to Oxbridge. Um, but lots of children don't get to Oxbridge. And does that mean that they are failures? No. Um, children go to all kinds of universities. Some children don't go to university at all. That doesn't mean that they're failures. That uh, It means, hopefully, if that's what they've chosen and that's what they want to do, then well done to them. And that doesn't mean that they haven't been socially mobile. Um, and so it's really about uh, cr- questioning that position that we tend to have, which is we only celebrate rags to riches stories, when in fact we should be celebrating everyone. Right, let's go to another caller. It's Nick in Western Superman. Nick, very good evening. What would you like to ask Catherine? Hello, Ian. Hello, Catherine. I'm, I'm actually in Shropshire at the moment, travelling around the country. Okay. I, I run a, a non-profit focusing around creativity in schools. And I must admit, I think Catherine does a lot of good work and talks a lot of sense. I don't agree with everything she says. And, and I'm very keen to avoid binary conversations where people just like one thing and then 
typically you have to dislike everything that person does. I think my question to Catherine really is, Catherine, do you really think that one size does fit all? Um, because you're very passionate and very opinionated, um, sometimes divisively so. Um, do, do you really think that your approach should and could be applied to every school in the country? Because I, I honestly believe that, that the school's minister, Nick Kidd, would love to see that. I just wondered if you feel that would be appropriate. Well, it depends. So we have silent corridors because we're a school in the inner city. If you've got a selective girls' school, you probably don't need silent corridors. So, you know, you pick and choose what you need for your context. I thought those would be the noisiest. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you, you, you pick and choose depending on what it is that you need for your context and for your children. But the things that I would say work for everyone... Uh, having high standards on behaviour, giving out detentions uh, when children are naughty. I don't think it's the end of the world. They sit a 20, 30 minute detention and they go home. Um, Being consistent in your approach to teaching in the classrooms. So um, the teacher leading from the front and imparting knowledge. Uh, This is going to help children, whether they're black or white or from the north or from the south or whether they're 18 or 5. It doesn't matter. Children are children. So yes, there are some things that I think uh, should should happen in all schools. It, it's sort of like a doctor, right? You, 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 if you're doing heart surgery, there are some basics that all doctors are going to do. And no one would question the doctor for, for sort of doing the same thing that the other doctors are doing. And no one would say, we need to have a variety of ways to, to do heart surgery. Now, there might be changes on the on the outskirts, you know, and, and you make some changes, but generally speaking, the core of it will remain the same. I think the same thing goes for teaching. Nick? If they're in a school that don't have a silent corridor policy, the school is vibrant, it's lively, the children have great personalities, their results are good. Um, I, I personally wouldn't want my children, my sons to go to your school, and that's no disrespect to you, because I know it's a very different setting and you do a great job for the young people in your care. But, I mean, do you, do you really feel that it's right to criticise the practices of other teachers that are deeply held, that are highly effective, if not endorsed by the current government and the school's minister, Mr Gibb? Well, it depends on whether or not they're highly effective. So I think if you were to look at schools that are very successful and compare them, I think you'll find similar methods that are happening in those schools. Um, uh, you know, uh, of course, quite happy for someone to say, go and take a look at this school that's the opposite, uh, that doesn't do those things, and you'll see how effective it is. And I'd love to see their progress eight, and I'd love to see their results, and I'd love to see their classes. I'm more than happy. What, what is this progress eight thing? Oh, progress eight just demonstrates the progress that children make from when they start at the secondary school and then when they finish. Um, and so it demonstrates the progress that the children are making as opposed to, well, we're just going to look at their attainment. Because obviously, you know, if you if you have a more selective intake, you might get higher attainment. That's not what's important. It's the progress. So I'm more than happy to go and see what they're, what they're talking about. Uh, you know, when I visit successful schools, I see that they tend to have certain things in common. Uh, and what are those things? They have high standards for behavior. They will have behavior systems that work and that are consistent across the school. They'll have teachers leading from the front and imparting knowledge and making knowledge central to that, those classrooms. Um, they will have certain values that they're teaching the children, like taking personal responsibility, making sure homework is complete. You'll find consistency in the teaching methods across the different classrooms. Um, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to be proved wrong on this. Please invite me to the schools and I'll go and see where they're doing things in an opposite well, that's, fashion. There's an invitation for you, Nick. Thank you very much for your call. Uh, Michael in Rains Park texts this. Is Catherine concerned about the worldview that students are coming out of school with? More and more, history appears to be taught purely through the prism of race, sex, sexuality, etc. Have a Merry Christmas. You too, Michael. Yes, I am concerned. We teach British history. We teach British geography. Uh, When we teach British history, we teach the good and the bad. Um, I know that, you know, there are families, uh, you know, that I know across the country who will say to me um, that they worry that their child is coming home uh, with this narrative of Britain being this terrible country and terrible things. Did you know they colonized X, Y and Z? And of course, we want to teach that. But there's lots of good that Britain did and and lots of bad, and you need to teach both. Um, I also think we ought to teach a love of one's country, and that doesn't mean you cannot be critical of it. I love Britain, and I'm I'm extremely critical of our education system, for instance. So it is possible to do that. Um, We believe at Michaela in patriotism. Um, 
And, you know, we sing God Save the King and Jerusalem and I Vow to Thee My Country. We take the no November the 11th very seriously and all of us have poppies on and, uh, you know, the, the reverence that we have for the dead and those who died so that we can live in freedom. We understand that. And I think the humility that it teaches us all, including the children, is important. Um, yeah. I, I, it depends on your values. And I understand, you know, the man who rang in and said, I don't want to send my children to your school. Well, that's fine. I mean, you know, each to his own. You can send your children where you like. I do think, however, that families should have the option of a more traditional school that offers them a more traditional education. You uh, get your kids through the local authority, you said. Um, yes. Are, are you oversubscribed in the sense that are, are there more parents that want to send their kids to you than there are places? Yes. Yes, there are. So that's the ultimate judgment, isn't it? Yes, no, exactly. And the parents are happy and the children are succeeding. So why would anyone resent that? I suppose people might say, well, we don't resent that. We resent the fact that, you're, that I'm saying, look at these methods. Why don't you take them and see, you know, use them for, for better in your own classrooms? The thing is, is that I've known uh, hundreds of teachers who have done exactly that. Uh, sometimes because they visited us and used these methods, sometimes because they've just done it on their own and things improve for them in mm. their classrooms. So why would we want to fight this? Why, if it helps children learn and means that your disadvantaged children in particular are, are going to learn more, then why wouldn't we want that for all children, really? Um, I, I don't know, you know, and I'm speaking to teachers when I'm saying that. Families, of course, will make their own decision about what schools they want to send their children to. We have 15 more minutes with Catherine Burble Singh. Then we hand the airwaves over to Cliff Richard. Well, not hand them over because I'll be asking questions as well. Um, but uh, if you'd like to speak to Catherine over the next 15 minutes, the number to call 0345 6060 It's 846. LBC. Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.48 is the time on LBC. Catherine Burblesing is with me taking your calls. Uh, Nikki's phoning in from Barcelona. Hello, Nikki. Hello. Good evening. Hi. I'm enjoying listening listening to the conversation. I'm, this is more of a philosophical 
um, from a philosophical perspective. I'd be very interested to know um, your opinion on Sir Ken Robinson, who is considered to be an educationalist of the 21st century. Um, what's your opinion on his his perspective of what we need to do with education in general? Yeah, well, I was very critical of uh, Sir Ken when he was alive. I don't like to speak ill of the dead. Um, but in terms of his philosophy, I, I do think he's wrong uh, in the things that he says. Um, just, just, I've, I've what, what can, I just, can I just ask why? Because as he, as he stated, our educational systems across, and this is across the board, you know, it's across most countries and all the rest of it, were set up for the Industrial Revolution and to prepare a workforce going changing from an agricultural workforce going into an industrial revolution. We actually haven't changed the educational system in more than 100 years or more. And now what our kids need are actually different skills. They need to be taken away from standardised testing because, as we know, development of children happen at different times. They don't happen, you know, at year eight, at year 10, at year 11. And not everybody follows along those lines. Okay, well, hang hang on, hang on, Nikki. You asked a question, Catherine, let her answer it. Okay, well, let's take the testing, for example. I think uh, testing is really important. If you don't test children, uh, it's, it, you don't know where you're at. Um, the child doesn't know. The school doesn't know. Um, you're unable to think, right, actually, we've got to do this differently to make sure we reach these standards. You've got to set standards, and then you've got to test. Now, that doesn't mean that you teach to the test. The test should test you know, say 20%, but you're, te- you're teaching 100%. But because you don't know what you're going to be tested on, you end up learning the 100%. Uh, when you have tests, it galvanizes the children, it galvanizes the teachers, it galvanizes the entire school. Um, so I, I do think we ought to have tests for those reasons. Um, and it's helpful for children learning how to prepare for tests and then learning how to pass them and do well at them. Uh, these are all skills that they will need later on, not because we're working in agriculture, but because it's any number of different jobs that they'll go into, they will have deadlines to meet. They will have uh, they will they will have to overcome stresses in their lives throughout their lives. And testing is one good way to help them build up those good habits of learning to to, 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 to make them successful later on in the future. OK, Nikki, thank you. Let's go to Sam in Acton. Hello, Sam. Hello, Ian. Good to speak to you again. Last week I spoke to you and I described the UK as this other Eden. This I remember and I, and I played Jerusalem on my phone. Absolutely, thank you, Ian. And now I would like to ask. <laughs> if you want, if, one by the way, question. by the way, Sam, if you want to hear that back, I've put it on my website because I thought it was such a great call. <laughs> I'll go there right away. <laughs> Meanwhile, let me ask Catherine one question. Before I do that, I worry about my background. In my native Uganda, I was brought up not to speak to any teacher until asked to speak. As a result, I totally agree with Catherine on the non-negotiable need for discipline, hard work, and testing. However, there's a catch, Catherine. In my African community, we're having a problem. Our kids are claiming that we are pushing them towards courses like engineering, medicine, pharmacy, and law, and I believe that some of my Asian friends also have the same challenge. I know of a family or two whose child walked away from a medical school, claiming that he was pushed there by his father. He didn't like the course, so the father wanted him to do law so as to be able to brag in future that my son is a doctor. That's not the reason. We Africans, and I think some Asians, want to give our kids the best opportunity for social mobility, which is in your, in your area. Not to take too much time, Catherine, what advice would you give us Africans how to handle choosing careers for our children so that it's a win-win? The kids win, we also lead them in what we think is the right direction. 
That's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because I know yes. my friend Aisha Hazarika, she always says that she's a great disappointment to her parents who uh, are Asian because she didn't become a doctor or an accountant or a lawyer. Mm. Yet she's had a really successful career as a broadcaster. Well, and I would come back to my original point about social mobility. Uh, while I have huge admiration for parents who want the very best for their children, um, what they ought to try and remember is what they really want for their children is for them to be happy and to feel that they have purpose in their lives and that they're able to fulfill their talents. And not everyone wants to be a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist and, or an accountant. Um, and fine if that's what your child wants to do. But if they want to do something else, support them in that endeavor because ultimately if you moved halfway across the world in order to give your child a better life, you did so so that your child would be happy. And if they end up going into a profession which makes them unhappy, that isn't really what you want for them. It isn't. And so what you need to do is just broaden your ideas about what that might be. And so it might fill you with fear, the idea that your child goes off to study history at university or French and Spanish or, or English. And you think, what are they going to do with an English degree? But they're going to enjoy that English degree and then they'll find, they'll find something that they love. You know, they will. You've just got to believe in that. It's what's so wonderful about being in a Western country like Britain. You know, there's so much opportunity and there's so much available. And, and the idea of pursuing something that you can't stand, I always say... I don't work in my life. I don't because I love my job. And that means I've never worked a single day in my whole life. And there's nothing better than never having to work. So, <laughs> you know, you, you, you want your children to have that opportunity in life, really, to be because we spend so much of our time working, don't we? And to be in a job you hate, there's nothing worse. Sam, I'm not going to play Jerusalem this time, but another great call. Thank you very much. Let's go to Hawa in Wilsdon. Good evening. Hello. Hi, what would you like to ask? Hi, I just have a question about children who are fasting. Okay. Because at the school, children who are Muslim and they fast during Ramadan, they still have to sit in the same room with children who aren't fasting and they have to sit on the table and serve them and have to sit there and watch them eat, which is very harsh. But the thing is, my children go to the school. I love the school. They teach them so well. I've noticed so many differences in my children's attitude towards their behavior. And it's it's 100%, 10 out of 10. I love it for them. I would always recommend it. It's just that one thing. I just think it's very harsh that if they're fasting, they have to sit on the table and watch others eat. Okay, Catherine? Yes. Well, the thing is, is that one of the reasons why your children are so different and so well behaved and so engaged and so on is because of the lunch hour. The lunch hour is the beating heart of the school at, at Michaela. It isn't just about eating lunch. In fact, that's that's a side issue. It's about the conversation. It's about sitting at the tables and engaging with the other children. It's about the lunch leader, because we have a lunch leader who sets a topic of conversation and they learn all kinds of soft skills. It really is the beating heart, as I say. And whenever vi guests come to the school, they always go into the lunch hall because otherwise they wouldn't really see the school. And so all the wonderful things that you see in your children, the changes that make them so successful is in part due to the fact that they are in that lunch hall. So we wouldn't want to divide the children according to race and religion because that's just too divisive. We want us all together. We not only belong to our country, we belong to our school, we belong to our year group, and we belong to our form class. And all of that sense of belonging uh, gives our children, um, it, it makes them more self-reliant, it makes them more resilient and ambitious, and you would, your children would lose out if they weren't able to do that. And um, uh, you just need to sort of trust me on this. <laughs> we, we know what we're doing. And while well, Have you had any pushback from Muslim parents? Well, once I mean, in a while. Clearly, Howard is not yeah, happy. Yeah, once in a while, but they, they tend to be fine with it. I mean, um, and that's because they understand what I'm saying here, just how important it is. Um, and and they love the school. And, you know, my thing is, you know, if there's one thing that bothers you about the school and that's it, you're doing pretty well. <laughs> OK, let's, um, Howard, thank you very much for that. Let's move on to Ed for a final question from East Grinstead. Hello, Ed. Hello there. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. What would you like to ask? Well, really, it was more curiosity. Um, I've spoken to you before, Ian, about various political things. You probably won't remember, but anyway. Um, I remember every call, Ed. 
particularly you yours. You do not. You do not. <laughs> lie, lie, punk on fire. But Catherine, Catherine's really taken my ear with education stuff. And I just wanted to ask her, is that I have two kids, um, and I want, I want to try and gauge her influence on it, because in this country, I think we're offset on kids that are, say, artistically English-minded, um, with the sense that, I have a boy who's going to be an engineer or a scientist, I swear to God. He loves Lego. He loves anything to do with science, space, everything else. Whereas my daughter, she does the aptitude test in math, and she always performs well, but she doesn't necessarily uh, put herself to the top of the class, even though the teachers say she, she just aces it. It's almost like it's non-effort to her. So I suppose my question is, and I've seen what she's trying to do. And would she be interested in trying to reform education, probably not under this government, but so that kids are honed in the skills that they have and that is natural to them? Okay. Because, as I said, my son is 10. He is a natural-born maths uh, enthusiast, whereas my daughter is complete okay. polar opposite of that. Ed, thanks for the question. Catherine? Yes, although the thing is, is that when you're at secondary school, you need to be good at all, everything, really. You, you, and when I say good at everything, you need to try and get better at maths, try and get better at history and so on. And then you reach a certain standard by the time you're 16. And then after that, you can specialise in the things that you love. So your son will probably end up specialising in engineering or maths later and your daughter will do will specialise in something else. But it's good for both of them to reach certain basic level by the time they reach 16. Catherine, thank you very much indeed. It's been a great hour. I think people have really enjoyed listening to you, even if they've disagreed with you on, yeah. on, on a lot yes. of things, which of course mm. will happen. Thank you very much indeed. Well, coming up in the next hour, we'll be talking to Sir Cliff Richard. Um, he is, uh, he's got a new Christmas album out. It's called Christmas with Cliff. We're going to be talking a little bit about that, but so much more to talk to him about as well. I wanted, it's my final programme of the year today, so I wanted to finish on a high note and um, he's one of my heroes. I tried not to be a fanboy. You've got an hour to discuss